also the idea was for the panel was to bring here uh, the people who are enabling but also capitalizing on the alignment of city and technology from establishing the IT infrastructure for hy the hyper-connected city to managing and standardizing the databases that are growing at an exponential rate to the novel use of the data for productive uh, real estate services, but also for the support and financing of the next wave of innovation that uh, uses this uh, very powerful alignment. So we have here the leader who are just doing that, and I will uh, introduce them briefly, but I really encourage you to look up their full bios on the website, but also in your program. So on my right, Jody Botifol, uh, Cisco, System, uh, Cisco Systems President for Latin America, responsible for developing, developing and executing the company strategies throughout the region. Next is Patricia McCartney, President and CEO of the World Council on City Data, known as WCCD a professor of political science and the director of the Global Cities Institute at the University of Miami. Toronto. Oh, Toronto. <laughs> University of Toronto, <laughs> where I was before I came to Miami. <laughs> that was wishful thinking. Uh, Jeff Frieden serves as the executive chairman for 10X, uh, formerly known as Auction.com, the country's largest online real estate marketplace, which he co-founded in 2007. Sean Abrahamson co-founded Urban.us to fund and serve startups that make cities better. Urban.us currently works with 15 startups and a global network of more than 700 experts. Now, each will give a short presentation before we launch into the discussion, starting with Jody. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. That's a great pleasure to be here with, with my colleagues. And uh, uh, this is a very fascinating uh, subject because uh, we talk something that it changed people's life, increases the standard of living. And when we take some of the existing economies around the world, uh, then we see the commodities uh, fluctuation right now. So some of those countries that the economy depend on pretty much on commodities, they are suffering right now. Uh, really, uh, they are struggling. But at the same time, they, they have to make great efforts to move into a knowledge-based knowledge economy, which means digitizing the entire economy, really to foster the digital agenda within those countries to allow innovation to create new economic business model all, all across. For example, when we talk about digitizing cities, when we talk about using internet of everything, or internet of the things to connect the unconnected, all, all across, when we talk about that, we, we, are, we think that this is a way to use a business and technology architecture to do different things. We have, in some the countries, audio. Is the audio is off. We're, when we talk about digitizing, when we talk about building a smart city, how that is impacts to the, to the human being, uh, we are just, we are a sponsor of the Olympic Games. And we are developing and helping Rio de Janeiro to become a smart city, which means in somehow to use technology massively to increase mobility to the entire city, which means also to ensure some specific districts, they come from a very obsolete districts into a very, very innovative districts, Puerto Maravilla, that they, we have digitized an entire, and we help startups to come in and to create a virtual innovative uh, circle around, which is similar that I remember to be part of the Barcelona Olympic uh, process many, many years ago when they renovated the maritime front and they used massively technology to create what we know now District 22 Act, which is 10% to the entire city 
and that created thousands and thousands of qualified jobs around. And it created an innovative economy around the city. Because when a city moves into a knowledge-based economy, innovation, creation of things, it really helps to keep a much more balanced economic flow uh, all across the, the city. So let me give you some, some examples, of course, because I think it's really important. Um, you have, in a smart city, you have millions and millions of sensors receiving data, data about many things. There is a data center with the software layers that interpret that data. And based upon the old information we have, that data will help to create new things in the retail industry, in the tourist industry, around new citizen services. So any single building that you built must be part of that process, that digitization process. And it's a key component of the national competitiveness. That is the District 22 Act in Barcelona many years ago. Any building was built with that direction. This is the Puerto Maravilla district in Rio de Janeiro. When you get in a smart city, and one of the main issues we have, for example, in Latin America, we have a large cities. There are millions and millions. Transportation is a mess, as you know, both physical, even virtual. So when you build some of the, when you use technology architectures to improve that massively and to organize some of the elements about transportation, you will see that the city mobility will increase. It means that the, the city will increase productivity. Any single building to be part of that is actually key because virtual and physical mobility will join, will, will merge. We have other examples like energy consumption. City become much more productive when, they, when we optimize the energy consumption. Today, when we use smart lighting models into the entire city, was against not just outdoors, but also indoors. When we do this and we help the power electricity companies to use a smart grid around, you see a full beneficial chain all across. And you could develop models much more, from an energetic point of view, much more optimal. And that helps for the city productivity. Why is that important? Because national competitiveness, especially in the knowledge-based economy, will rely on our ability to make smart everything. And using technology, smart cities, connected industry, connected healthcare, connected education, intelligent citizen services, all together will join around. So any single development design from your side should take that into account in advance. And that will provide an, a value to the user that will buy. We talk about permit, we talk about space, we, we talk about stadium, or we talk about any public ent, uh, building or any space. When we talk about the concept of urban space changed dramatically when you move into the virtual world versus the physical world. And you need to consider in any kind of living process that the virtual world will take more and more leadership in, in that way. You need to control my time because I love to speak. Oh, you're fine, you're fine. That's fine? I'm fine, yes. Okay, how many, how many minutes do I have? Okay. Uh, no the, no the problem. Other, the other subject is qualified jobs, job creation. So you attract mothers. I was talking about sensors and millions millions of uh, new data possibilities. We call big data. If we have a people flow information and we have people patterned information, we know from industry perspective, we know where we should be located we know how we can influence those patterns, and we know what kind of products I should develop to address those patterns, those new patterns. I always talk about the shoes industry. You can imagine having sensors in the shoes that they detect how you walk and how your organism, how your body, depending how you walk, you can simulate the kind of back problems that you will have in five years, six years. I tell you. 
most of the people at 50, 50s, if they knew that in advance, will avoid back problems. Now, that model, which is Internet of Everything, Internet of the Things, will change the shoes industry, will change the sport industry, will change the healthcare industry, because you will bring about back healthcare elements, you will bring about the way you have to change the, your walking, and also how you can design the shoes. This is a simple example. Today, less than 1% about all the things in the world are connected. So you can imagine if you connect just 10% about it. Again, you can extrapolate that into your inside home, in a city, in a community, or even in an industry. We know that commodities, it's a great income for Latin America, for example, or emerging countries, right? So you need to improve the productivity, you need to optimize the way of things to reduce costs massively. Internet, using Internet of everything, Internet of the things, the mining industry is so important. When you include technology into the, into the tracks and you develop a new operating model that will help to be more efficient all across. So there is always a digitization acceleration framework at country level, every country. And there are three main pillars, government efficiencies, national competitiveness and social inclusion that's the other piece so government efficiency all the internet everything technologies will help to provide better citizen services and more government efficiencies around cost optimization national competitiveness smart cities connected industries when you go to social include and the digital the country digital agenda all governments all the prime ministers government officers we have the chance to meet we discuss about this, which, by the way, influence a lot into the developing developer <coughs> community. And social inclusion, which means education, healthcare. Great asset to most of the emerging countries, like, like Latin America, youth. There's, there are more young people than ever. Providing them the right education, educational platform will help those people to move into the innovation economy-based model, rather than the classic one. So I think it's a very fascinating subject, as I said before. I think this community, all of you have a key role, and we have an opportunity, especially right now, with the current global economy uncertainties, to change that model using massively technology. Thank you very much. Thank you. Everyone can hear yes. me? Yes. Um, thank you very much, Rudolf, for inviting me to Miami. It's always a pleasure to be in the South when you leave. I left Toronto this morning. It was shooting from minus 25, and I was told that's without the wind chill. So <laughs> it's lovely to be here. Thank you very much for hosting this. Um, so I'm here to talk to you about data. Um, I know it sounds boring, but this is actually built on an ISO standard, and I don't know how many engineering types are in the room, but the International Organization for Standardization, ISO, usually certifies things like um, light bulbs, computer parts, tractor parts, etc. But we build an ISO standard uh, for city data. Uh, because when we started back in 2006, um, we started 2006 with an idea that we needed to have better data. For those of you who are working in this field, I know that you have um, lots of struggles with data and lots of challenges. And why? Because one, the data is not standardized. So Chicago can't really talk to Miami, uh, nor to Chicago, especially to Toronto across that single border, uh, Shanghai, Dubai, etc. So we started working globally with cities around the world to standardize data so that we have apples to apples comparators. Um, that started in 2006, and by 2014, just uh, very recently, we have the first ISO standard, so standardized definitions, standardized methodologies, uh, and especially, it was mentioned earlier on an earlier panel, standardized boundaries, so that we are measuring um, and having um, metrics that you can actually have comparative work. So I'm just going to show you a video because 
we hired someone to put all of this into um, two minutes, <laughs> which I would probably take 10 minutes to tell you about. So if you could show the video, it should work. And these are the cities that we're working with currently. The world is changing at light speed. Cities are growing and evolving, searching for innovative, intelligent ideas and alternative futures that determine the path forward in urban centers. Diverse cultures, geographies, and economies with only one common language, data. What if we could find a comprehensive way to compare these diverse cities? with a truly consistent platform for standard urban metrics so that cities could share knowledge, guide smart and sustainable development and learning, measuring performance to vastly improve quality of life. This is the call of the World Council on City Data and ISO 37120, the first ever international standard for cities. We're at the epicenter of a worldwide effort to standardize urban metrics, a global hub for creative learning partnerships across cities, international organizations, corporate partners, and academia. Rural life is giving way to urban development. Cities are planning for resilience and for changing climates, learning from each other. Together, we're delivering the essential tools cities, business leaders, planners, designers, and professionals need to build more livable, sustainable, and prosperous urban centers, to foster innovation, to provide a clear method for defining and determining indicators that can help measure performance in a universal language, to drive sustainability, quality of life, and investment in cities worldwide. The World Council on City Data, created by cities for cities. ISO 37120 is really a tool for cities and for stakeholders in cities to help to think about how to manage, better manage cities, how to benchmark, um, especially from baseline data that's comparable. We're looking at now um, how this database can be used for creditworthiness, so we're talking to some of the credit rating agencies like S&P and Moody's uh, for, for uh, municipal bond issuance. Uh, we're looking at also um, how Resilience and smart and sustainable go together to actually help to uh, drive um, uh, planning and um, uh, also in terms of insurance because resilience in cities now has become such an important topic. We're being pushed to add a whole lot of new indicators so that insurance companies can better think about how uh, cities and urban communities can recover from shock, which is you know clearly something that we all face in Toronto ice storms and in New York, Hurricane Sandy, et cetera. Uh, monitoring and evaluation, of course, is one of the big things in terms of investment in infrastructure. So the, um, our government in Canada, for example, has just announced $60 billion in an infrastructure fund under our new Prime Minister Trudeau, uh, who's just been recently elected. They're rolling that out over the next 10 years. But city data, again, to drive in, um, the openings uh, for where this investment is most needed and then, and then to benchmark the investment progress over time. So those are the kinds of things we're looking at. As a result of going through ISO, I actually chair the, world, the, the working group on uh, um, indicators at ISO now and um, we're building a new standard for smart cities, which could be um, quite interesting to work with you together with you on. Um, and we're also building one for resilient cities because of the sh external, especially climate shocks, but also financial crisis and um, um, cybersecurity, etc. So in the first ISO standard that we've been testing, we rolled it out to 20 cities. It's um, 100 indicators across 17 themes. And these are all the usual themes in, in, across cities that um, we're concerned about. And I thought I would just give you quickly a briefing um, on some of the uh, data points that we're building. So this is the uh, certification scheme that we're building at the WCCD so that cities are actually becoming certified. That means under ISO rules that the uh, data has to be uh, third-party verified. 
So we hired um, auditing companies who've been um, certifying 9,001, 9, 14,001, other big ISO standards to actually have third-party verified data. So we're trying to build the highest caliber of data that we can find um, to um, um, support cities in development. These are the first certified cities that we've been working with, so it's a very um, important global effort. And um, we're welcoming now the next 100 and probably the next 500 over the uh, coming uh, few years. Um, a number of global partnerships have been growing around this effort over these past few years because of the interest in good data. It's very um, um, scarce. <laughs> So we um, built this data portal. We launched it in Los Angeles. Um, Mayor Garcetti is very interested in um, high caliber data and building what he calls a culture of data in cities. So we went to Los Angeles to actually launch the portal at his invitation. He was just starting the um, LA Tech Fest. It was on the eve of the LA Tech Fest. So we went to LA and launched the open data portal. Uh, with this first 20 cities certified data in it. And when you land on the portal, it's open, so please do visit it. Um, these are the kinds of data points that we um, start to look at. So um, this is alternative to a car, for example, how people commute. That's a very high number for London. Um, public transit trips, kilometers of bike lanes, uh, green space, etc. I'm just giving you a glimpse of uh, out of the 100. Uh, new patents, higher ed degrees higher number of businesses. All of that tracking is quite um, useful, but when you actually go deeper into the portal, this is where you can actually start to graph and you can choose any one of the themes. So economy, for example, unemployment rates, um, commercial industrial property values, a number of new patents and businesses, etc. Or you could look at transit. So you just click on any of the themes. Um, commercial air connectivity, I know, could be of interest to um, some of you in the development, real estate development field. So you can um, then start to graph. So this is, um, if you click on the environment one, PM 2.5, for example, comes up. That's the air quality, so it's particulate matter in the air, which is becoming, um, I'm told um, by my colleagues in real estate, that this is a very important indicator for cities to think about uh, because PM 2.5 levels um, really do matter to health. That's the level of particulate matter that actually gets into your bloodstream. So um, when I was um, just coming out of Beijing, it was a, at 110, and the red flag went up, and Beijing had closed schools. When I landed in Delhi, it was 440. So it was four times worse than Beijing. Um, it was like a white fog. I thought my hotel window was frosted, <laughs> but it was just white. So 440 p.m. 2.5 is... Um, I'm just going to flash through these I'm, um, because I know my time is limited. So that's commercial and industrial uh, property values. So this is a percentage of total assessed value. You can map it. You can see where Dubai sits relative to Amman, Jordan. As this grows to 100 data points too, it'll be... Um, quite uh, increasingly robust. Uh, number of businesses per 100,000, commercial air connectivity, kilometers of bike paths. Bike, bike lanes, I was thinking of the millennial panel before as I was sitting in the audience listening to it. Um, this thing about bike paths uh, and the economy, some of the, my team in um, the Toronto office have started looking at um, cycling and bike lanes and, and as an indicator for um, income and um, retail. So this is a study from the New York City Department of Transport, for example. And it's this, um, this kind of downtown core that don't want to buy cars anymore, but they will bike and they will walk. So walkability and bikeability are becoming quite important indicators. So we're starting to build those out as well, and livability indicators that are already in 37120. As I mentioned, we're starting to build a smart city standard as well. So this is the framework that we came up with last month in Vienna at the last ISO meeting. And um, this is the framework that ISO has been helping us to develop. So 37120 will be the platform, and then we build uh, indicators that go deeper into the smart cities agenda. So that whole set of indicators now for smart cities is under discussion. So Everyone is welcome to contribute to that process because it's um, quite critical that strong voices are at the table to make sure we get it right. So I would encourage any of you interested in this to give us a hand because it's a really tough process. 
Um, finally, um, what we're finding with our cities to date is that there's this incredible drive to um, city to city learning. Because once you get comparative data that Shanghai and Chicago can talk to each other, for example, you um, start to have lessons and uh, solutions coming out of these cities. So, for example, residential electrical use, we, we, when you map that, you can see, um, for example, there's Amsterdam. So what are they doing that's driven down um, energy use in kilowatt hours per capita? So the inquiry and the publication that we're getting together, they've been looking at municipal buildings. They're all going to be carbon neutral by last year. Use of district cooling, reducing costs by up to 70%. Feedback from smart energy meters with these um, through, throughout both households and commercial, et cetera. So finally, I wanted to touch on some of the uses of the data because as um, many of our mayors have started to recognize, if you're building a good culture of data in cities, you're also building a culture of innovation. And it's that loop that we're really starting to consider in, in the WCCD as we move forward. So we're working with Delft University out of Rotterdam and they have been mapping these using ISO 37 data across the Randstad, which is Amsterdam, Rotterdam, et cetera. This is um, retail, creative sector, and real estate values mapped throughout this, this, um, this region. So we're starting to look at how the data can actually build better maps. And S3, I know, has come out with incredible maps just this week on boundary changes of cities, which um, I was just looking at from my phone a few minutes ago. So these, um, this mapping is one of the tools, one of the uses of the data. We're also looking at um, Siemens has approached us. This is the other thing I should mention. There's um, a lot of corporate interest in how to use this data, and they're helping us to think about tools, et cetera. So Siemens, for example, is looking at long-term strategic planning tool, the SIP tool, and we've been helping them to build the data back end of that. Um, we're also working with Hatch, which is a big engineering company, to um, look at how um, we can start to have peer groups of cities in comparative kind of dashboard, but a dashboard backed up with third-party verified and ISO standardized data. But then, so Toronto, Boston, Los Angeles, uh, London, for example, that are already in the database, you can see how the needle starts to move with your peer cities and where you sit. So um, finally, in closing, I just wanted to mention we're starting to uh, build these global partnerships. So United Nations Environment Program um, to develop a GREC tool on resource efficiency in cities. That's now under development in five cities. Uh, UNISDR is the big resilience arm of the UN in, out of Geneva. We've just signed an agreement with them and we're testing again with model cities. And we're having insurance roundtables now in North America to look at how insurance um, and uh, indicators for more resilient cities uh, can be uh, fed into the UN uh, system um, on their 10 essentials, as they call them. And we have other partnerships growing. Um, we're also developing an international advisory board because this thing is kind of taking off and we need, we need um, intelligent people with us. So we've invited the 20 first foundation cities who are now certified under ISO 37120. So all 20 mayors have joined our international advisory board. And we're starting to invite corporate partners like Siemens, um, um, anyone here in the room, uh, real estate industry, insurance industry is also um, approaching us. Uh, we're having um, a couple of new um, areas in banking as well and how, how to look at some of these indicators. So we're starting to build out this corporate advisory board. Uh, it might be of interest to some of you also because of the global aspect of all this. We've been invited to open an office in Beijing uh, from the Ministry of Housing and Urban Development, Mohert, Urban and Rural Development, ha Ministry of Housing, Urban and Rural Development, China. Um, that one uh, is because China is actually adopting ISO 37120 for all its cities. So that means the data for Chinese cities will be growing and becoming more robust as well. So we will open, well, we have opened the office. I just haven't seen it yet. My colleagues have, but um, I'm going in June. Uh, we've also just had admission to India because, um, as most of you know, India and China are two big leaders on the smart cities agenda. They're each looking at 100, 100 or so. <laughs> it's even growing in India right now under um, Prime Minister Modi. So we've just had a mission to India to look at smart cities and how the data informed um, 
and evidence-based decision-making can help to inform that smart city agenda in India. Uh, the data at the city level, again, like most countries, is quite weak. National statistical offices gather it, but they gather it in very uneven ways. So we're starting to build a, um, um, a called the Data for Cities in India initiative with Tata Trusts. Uh, Tata has a large philanthropic side to them, which uh, we're working with to develop that idea. Um, we have an MOU with the government of Mexico to pilot 37120 across 15, I think it is, Mexican cities now. And finally, the Executive Council of Dubai has uh, partnered with us, and they will be hosting our first um, Global City Summit in Dubai at uh, the end of this year. So that's where we're at. It's um, something that's growing because of the demand for, for good data at city level. So I'm happy to take any questions at the end. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is uh, Jeff Frieden. I'm the co-founder and executive chairman of 10X, our new brand, formerly auction.com. <laughs> I thank Toby and the Dean and the University for having me today. Um, 10X is the largest online real estate transaction portal in the world. We've traded about $40 billion of real estate. Um, about 1,000 uh, full-time team members in the company. Uh, although I am a, in Orange County and have, we have five or 600 people in Orange County, California, um, our headquarters, the whole management team's in Silicon Valley. So. Uh, and we have offices uh, across the country, including uh, a very large office here on Brickell in Miami. For, so I've done my recruiting uh, two seconds on that. So, um, so we think about three things a lot at 10X. Uh, one is, is distribution, global distribution of real estate. Uh, two, we think about transparency and what has historically been a very non-transparent industry. And thirdly, and most importantly, we think about data. And so I'll take them individually. Distribution. My partner, Rob Friedman, and I started buying commercial real estate in Orange County, California in the 80s. It would have never occurred to us to go to Phoenix to buy real estate because real estate was so local to the MSA that we lived in. There was, we could not look on the internet and go to Phoenix there was no internet in the 80s that at least anybody could use. Um, and so we primarily bought in the MSA surrounding Orange County, LA, San Diego. Um, today, uh, by example, we recently on 10X sold a $96 million office building uh, in Manhattan Beach, California, which by the way was the largest online <coughs> transaction of anything in the world. Uh, the buyer, we had 28 bidders bidding on that asset. The buyer, was a Canadian-based, Chinese-backed company. That stuff just, if that had been done 20 years ago, I promise you that group would have not been there. Uh, for instance, we sold a five million, more local story, sold a five million dollar limited service hotel recently <clears throat> here in Florida, and the gentleman was on a cruise ship in the Bahamas bidding on his iPad. I mean, the world is connected, yeah, and and uh, so distribution that, that the internet has created for commercial real estate allows what the second theme is transparency. Allows for transparency for people to bid on a, on a level playing field. Whether you are a, the largest institutional real estate fund in the world or you're a high net worth family or you're like my friend, my very lucky friend in Orange County who just sold his company for billions of dollars, who by the way doesn't know anything about real estate, wants to be in the real estate, wants to buy real estate, and has bought a bunch of assets on 10X, and he doesn't even know anything about real estate. All right, and that brings me to thirdly, data. And uh, about 18 months ago when I was the CEO, we sat down uh, and we said, who would be the best strategic partner at the time to auction.com? And you know, if you were gonna do a, if you were gonna, you know, if you were going to disrupt uh, maybe a, a designing and architecture, you know, you might tap Apple, right? Marketplaces, you might tap Amazon, right? And we had a lot of good marketplace DNA in the organization. We have a lot of folks from LinkedIn and eBay and Trulia on our team. And we said, who's the best in the world at data? And so we sought out Google. And Google made a $50 million investment in, in us uh, about 18 months ago at a billion two valuation. And 
We still have the money on the balance sheet. We never needed the money. It was all about the strategic partnership with Google because nobody in the world is better at collecting data. Nobody is better in the world at interpreting it. And we sent our, and we sent, give you some examples, we sent our team of data scientists uh, to Google and we, and, and so the, the, the empowerment in commercial real estate that data gives is just, seems to me just to be paramount. And, you know, everybody's data in commercial real estate kind of sits in silos. You know, there's been great companies like CoStar have come out with RCA and Reese have come out with data, but everybody kind of feels like they have their own little competitive advantage with their own data. And, and so at 10X, you know, we want to empower buyers and sellers and the brokerage firms and brokers and the ecosystem around it with data. Buyers, you give them more data, more information, easily, readily available. You de-risk the real estate transaction. Ultimately, when, people, when, when deals are, are de-risked, they pay more. Sellers, sellers should know everything about their buyers. They should know everything from reputation. They should know everything from, do they have the ability to close? Do, do they, all of it through data, right? And so we at 10X spent a lot of time thinking about empowering brokers with better data. Uh, you may have read today, we had a, a pretty big press release about a deal we did with CCIM, a uh, partnership we did with CCIM uh, recently. Again, it's about empowering the real estate brokers that can scale faster, we, are, we have a very big marketing budget. We're not only do we do lots and obviously digital advertising, but we're the largest advertiser in the Wall Street Journal. I mean, we still do good old fashioned direct mail, you know, and we empower brokers to really scale their businesses, use our marketing, right, and, and, and capture a whole bunch of more information about their future deals. And so really, you know, creating the ecosystem around the commercial real estate transactions and the empowerment that that data has done. And so, you know, for instance, with Google, we, with their chief economist, Hal Varon, and our chief economist, Peter Moino, we developed something called the Nowcast. And what the now, this is, a, I know, a commercial real estate group, but in, in single family world, nine out of 10 home searches start online today. Six out of 10 buyers today find their home online. You know, I'm old enough to remember getting in the back of the Cadillac and being driven around to be showed the houses, right? Now people find their homes, on, on, find their homes online. And so using Google, people Googling, for instance, Googling homes in Miami and overlaying our own data, we can actually predict home sales volume in real time. Something that is generally reported months in the rear. It's a little more difficult in commercial real estate because not all searches start online, but nine out of 10 residential ones do start online. So, you know, it's really, we really believe that data is our competitive advantage. Make, connecting people, use, giving them great information. You can go to our, our site right now and look at 5,000 commercial real estate transactions. Click the button, you can see every sales price. Complete transparency. And, and, and so it's very, you know, we really, really believe that the world is connected and that people want to purchase real estate from all over the globe and want to be in safe haven like the United States. I can tell you about a transaction where uh, a bid came in from Beijing on a, uh, and bought an $8 million <coughs> apartment building in, in Wichita, Kansas. All the news is the Chinese are buying in Miami and New York and California and San Francisco. Well, this was Wichita, Kansas, you know. And by the way, they paid a four cap. I'm not even sure they looked at it, right? <laughs> it's, you know, but it's the, the world, the, the distribution that the internet has given and the data. The data is everyone's in real estate's competitive advantage. And anybody who thinks that, 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 the, that the world is not gonna be Google's, Google's bet on us was that they believe that, you know, t five, 10, who knows how many years from now, the world is moving online. Everything is moving online. And data will be your competitive advantage. If you think we're going to do things the same way we do ne next year or five years or 10 years from now, I think you're going to be sorely disappointed. So thank you. Thank you. And uh, look forward to asking any questions. We'll see if the slides come up. So. Um, I think Rudy had me go at the end because I have like the craziest stuff to say that's like in general 10 years out. Um, so I started a venture fund about two and a half years ago, uh, a year after moving to Miami. Um, 
a lot of people may ask why sought a venture uh, uh, fund in Miami. Um, we just started. Uh, we really had no idea what we were going to do, and so called it a research experiment. Um, and I think you'll soon see why. Um, so we only care about a subset of startups. The only way that we will look at a deal is if we can make a case that the company will make a city better. Right? The definition of better um, we can discuss over drinks. So what I don't want is this. So any science fiction fans? Okay, so Blade, Blade Runner, this is the opening shot. This is what um, LA was going to look like sitting in 1982 and looking ahead to 2019. Um, so unfortunately, there is a huge gas leak like near LA. Um, so they may have got that wrong, but those are gas plumes. Um, and it was always dark because uh, the climate had changed, interestingly. Um, so here's what Blade Runner got wrong. Uh, all the tech was like a total miss, right? <laughs> so like, I don't know, Polaroid, anyone? Um, <laughs> Atari, I mean, I miss Atari. Uh, but yeah, the big stuff is no internet and no smartphones, right? Which would kind of be like, how the hell do you guess the future correctly if you didn't see those things? Um, but, uh, you know, Philip K. Dick, who wrote the novel that the, the film was built on or was based on, um, understood a lot of basic social things that made the film sort of spot on. Um, so he got that sooner or later we we're going to break the climate. Right, to which we, we've succeeded in. Um, he got that urbanization was going to be huge, that basically people would congregate in cities because that's where the opportunity would be. He couldn't see the farm being sort of extended far into the future. Um, AI uh, became the core of sort of tech policy. So if you remember, it's sort of how do you figure out the robots um, sort of hidden among the humans? Um, and yeah, if you look at folks like Elon Musk, that's sort of the biggest thing that they worry about. Um, uh, economic opportunity, I mentioned homelessness shows up. It's pretty pervasive. Uh, one thing that's consistent about cities around the world is you have very, very poor people living alongside some of the wealthiest people in the world. Um, law enforcement, always a problem. Flying cars that did policing. Uh, and then mobility challenges, so everything. Like, how do you move around? Um, there were boats, there were bicycles. Uh, but yeah, from 1982, a lot of this stuff looks very, very familiar. So here's what the tech looks like from our perspective. Uh, if you were going to redo Blade Runner, you'd sort of have to think about this stuff, right? And we have no publicly traded, well, there's a couple of publicly traded companies, but most of these companies didn't exist 10 years ago. Right? That's 10 years ago. So the lifetime of my fund is 10 years. I suspect the lifetime of a lot of your project is maybe in the three-year vicinity. But 10 years is not a long time. Like one decade is not a long time. So my kids will be going to college in 10 years. Right? That's still, it's just not a big amount of time to create. Uh, so yeah, unicorn private valuations could be in half. But call it $30 billion. But to go from zero to $60 billion in value is kind of amazing. Um, and, and there's plenty of other companies who've created plenty of value. Uh, WeWork, um, you know, uh, SolarCity, I think you would know, um, understand a lot of these. I, I put the comp with the sort of total amount invested. Um, just so we're clear, uh, I don't have a huge fund, and I try to invest right at the beginning. So my ideal, uh, and it's not true of any of these investments, would be to invest when they are about $5 million, not $50 billion. Um, so this is what we're trying to understand today, um, trying to figure out who are the companies that sort of five to 10 years out will define what cities look like. I'm going to give you a couple of examples. So this company is three years old. Uh, I think it's north of $100 million already. Um, they just uh, signed a deal with Autodesk, who invested. And they signed a deal with Komatsu, the sort of heavy equipment manufacturer in Japan. They make drones that um, basically organize themselves, collect data about construction sites. Um, some of that data goes into Autodesk, so you can understand what's going on. But some of that data literally tells construction equipment where to go. There are no people in the loop. Right? That's live in Japan now. Right? And so I talk about science fiction. A lot of our portfolio looks like science fiction, but this stuff is live. It's running. Someone's paying for this. 
right? Um, so drones are interesting toys, uh, but this is quite real. And the, and the idea is that you are cutting um, massive amounts of costs around surveying and measurement, and you're reducing errors, and that's, in some cases, you're reducing labor, unfortunately, uh, depending on your perspective about the future of the economy. Um, sort of things that don't fly, uh, in this case, things that are hidden in the basement and hopefully you never look at. Um, this is a team out of Denver. Uh, on average, they get about 40% water reduction when you switch out your residential irrigation controller. So there's literally nothing going on here other than a 15-minute install, and then you connect it to the internet and it figures out where it is. And it's like, oh, I know the humidity, and I know the wind speed, and I know a bunch of other parameters that tell me how quickly the water is evaporating. And based on that, I'm just not going to water the same amount every day, because that's different every day. Um, the reason this is interesting is when you look at US residential water, 30% goes into this crop that we never eat called your lawn. Right? So that's kind of interesting. So these guys actually have a shot at decoupling municipal water growth from overall growth. Right, so you're talking about people that could de delay bond issues. And so this is uh, one of the interesting things. It's a top selling product on Amazon, but probably the people who are most interested in talking to this company are municipal water people. And those are some of the sort of strange uh, sort of combinations of stakeholders that we see. Um, uh, this is very odd, but it, it's actually a one wheel uh, self-balancing skateboard. It, um, behaves like a snowboard, um, balances itself like a Segway, and yeah, you can ride it off road. So these are people going down a mountain bike trail. So what does this have to do with cities? So our sense is that your phone, really what you don't see in your phone is that it has processing and it has gyros. And, and those two things are so good that you can take the exact same hardware and basically use it in another device and enable it to balance itself. So effectively, this is riding a robot. The robot figures out what you want to do, and it doesn't let you fall down. In some cases, I've managed to fall off. Um, but the central idea here is that right now, this thing is $1,500. But when I can combine a battery, a motor, and essentially the guts of your phone, given the trends of all those things, within two to three years, it should be about three or $400. And at that point, if I can put this in my backpack, and use it on multimodal transport, then I think we see more people riding them. And just incidentally, they do about 20 miles an hour, and they go seven miles currently. But I expect both of those things to double fairly quickly. So double the price, double the performance, half the price um, kind of stuff that's fairly frequent. Um, sort of more immediately relevant, uh, invested in a marketplace, so, so also love uh, data in marketplaces. Um, Architizer connects uh, commercial architects to the firms that they try to source from. So for folks that have worked with architects, typically there's someone on the team who is an avid Google search person who is trying to figure out how to find the stuff that you want to include ultimately at, in the project. Um, and what architizers figure out is that they can do a much better job of connecting architects with the firms that ultimately land up supplying everything to uh, construction. So I think by their estimates, about 70% of what lands up in the finished product is actually spec by architects. So that's interesting um, for a couple of reasons. Um, and they've just gone live in New York. Um, other thing that we think about a lot from a climate perspective is, um, you know, if you, if you look at where our food comes from, um, most of the race is to figure out how do you adapt crops to the weather, right? So, the whole genetically modified crop, so whether you think that's good or bad, I, I don't want to entertain that, but I do want to posit that most of what's happening in GMOs is how do I keep up with the weather to some extent, right? Either hot or cold, too much rain, etc. So the other way to think about farming is forget the weather, just control the weather and do it indoors. And we can thank a lot of the people who have been growing weed, right, for helping <laughs> to drive down all of the technical costs. So yeah, everyone laughs, but it's really funny. The things that drove down the cost for online video was porn, right? So we're used to doing this sort of stuff we don't want to talk about that actually sets uh, a lot of the uh, economics for technology we land up benefiting from. Um, but in this case, this is a company that's going to be right next to New York City. 
they think they can compete on different types of leafy greens with leafy greens that are sourced from California. So they, based on the price point that they can achieve without labor, so a lot of automation, and low energy inputs. So just to give you a sense, the, the energy use of LEDs is about 95% lower than incandescence. But if I can tune an LED and only use the frequency of light to grow a specific type of crop, it will go down about 99%. So your energy costs are dropping um, you know, very, very quickly. And so when you stack all those inputs, you can change the cost of growing um, crops. And so final example um, is a team that does real-time damage assessments from earthquakes. So the end goal is to do this for all natural disasters, but right now it works very well for earthquakes. And the idea is that you can get seismic data, it's a public data feed, and you can put that into a machine learning algorithm that will look at uh, effectively historical damage. So basically after an earthquake, people go out and they survey, it takes a couple of years, uh, insurers, volunteers, uh, local governments, and they have that data set to train. And so they get the first time out, as is an earthquake, they get 80 to 90% accuracy on where there will be damage. So as you might imagine, insurers think this is very interesting, but obviously first responders, a lot of the challenge in an emergency is 911 is your only resource. Um, this does a lot better job of telling you where you are likely to need to deploy people, whether they're volunteers or um, you know, professionals. And so this company is just getting up and running in the Bay Area. Um, and you know, again, it's, it's, it's kind of amazing. The, the sort of federal government created this resource of seismic data, and it turns out um, you know, it took this long for someone to figure out how to use it, but it, it's pretty amazing. Um, a couple of stats. So as I mentioned, we, um, we started three years ago in Miami. Um, the thesis was um, you know, stop looking at all deals. So I've done angel investing for 10 years just focus on startups that make cities better. We have a tracking set of about 400 companies that are private, early stage, but growing at a decent rate. And so we cut that data in different ways just to sort of understand a little better what are we looking at? Like what's the state of urban tech, right? Um, so these are sort of two things that I think are interesting. Um, on the, I guess it's your right. It's, oh, it's my right. Um, the, a lot of people, when they think about smart cities, they think about things that local governments buy, right? And, and from our perspective, those are sort of B to G models. And it turns out that really that's a tiny percent, right? So it's less than 10% of the companies we see are trying to sell things into local government. The vast majority of them are either selling to consumers or they're selling to other businesses and fairly often to some part of the real estate business, either in construction or management. So I think that's you know, sort of one thing. When we talk about smart cities, at least from our perspective, um, we definitely don't mean large infrastructure projects. We definitely do mean lots of other channels, um, including consumers and businesses. And then the other thing is just sort of the mix of where uh, uh, people are building. Um, transportation might be obvious, but there's a massive amount of investment. Um, I think Uber sort of got everyone's hair on fire. Um, you can tell. Um, but, uh, this idea that you could rethink how we move around or how we move stuff around um, is a huge focus for a lot of venture capital at the moment. Less obvious is uh, resources, which is the green area. So in resources, we put things like waste, water, energy, uh, in some cases, air quality. Um, so there's actually still a massive amount of investment there. It's harder to see. Um, it doesn't always make for great video. Uh, it's not stuff that you would use every day. It's typically hiding somewhere in a basement. Um, so it's sort of an invisible layer of infrastructure, but a lot of investment still going into that area. Um, stuff that doesn't receive as much investment or, or really founders seem to be less interested in at the moment. Um, service delivery, so for us, it's basically anything that a local government would use to better deliver services. So no surprise, it's not easy to sell into local government if you're a small company. Um, that is changing. Um, and then the last is sort of built environment, which I would say broadly is, is sort of real estate, but also includes things like uh, public infrastructure. Um, so those are the two smallest areas. And then this is a little tricky to, uh, to see, but anyway, um, I think you can vaguely make out the, uh, 
the locations there. But um, main point here is when we look at where the companies are coming from, they correlate pretty well with where the big startup hubs are, or actually more explicit where most early stage investors and venture capital are. So we, we see a lot of companies um, sort of from all over. We don't have a lot of visibility into China. It's sort of its own market. Um, but in the US, it tends to be high concentration in New York Metro, uh, to some extent Boston, uh, and then obviously the Bay Area. So I'll close with this. Uh, so this is my probably favorite movie of the year, The Big Short. Anyone read the book or seen the movie? Okay, so yeah, I guess it's part of, if you in real estate, you kind of have to, um, to some extent. But this is my experience sort of most weeks, right? Most weeks we meet someone who could be Dr. Mike Burry, who could have like this massively interesting insight and then figure out the trade or figure out the product or figure out the thing that's gonna get you there. Um, and this is probably the hardest thing right now about trying to understand technology. There are very, very smart people with great insights who often have bad haircuts and no shoes, <laughs> right? And the, and the trick is to figure out like who's for real. Um, and that's where we spend most of our time, right? We try and understand people who have usually a very different view of what the world will be like in 10 years. And we try and figure out like <laughs> how much we can believe and we assume a third of the time they'll be wrong or they won't be able to execute. A third of the time they might be just right enough to get our money back. And then hopefully a third of the time, you know, we can do 10x or better on the investments. Um, and, you know, part of the concern for us is also the public benefit, right? So we care that a company like Ratio is growing very quickly. Um, it also happens that 500, ga 500 million gallons saved of water is an interesting number. Um, to have achieved, you know, sort of a year after shipping your first product. Um, so I'll leave it at that and we can go to questions. Thank you. So actually today we have been talking a lot about uh, how technology is uh, changing the field. This is the first panel which addressed trends associated with the millennials. Another way to describe it is about is trends associated with uh, new uh, information technology also. So, so but uh, when we talk about the smart city or the internet of things, or Cisco likes to refer to it as the internet of everything, because then that implies the completion of the internet's ecology where the connectedness of objects joins the virtual connectedness of the web. So when we are talking about the smart city, is, are we talking about something else? Is it not anymore the incremental change that we have seen and talked about uh, today, but is it a game changer? As we know with data, more is different, is qualitatively different. And we see how with the smart city, the the growth of the data is really exponential. And last year alone, we apparently we generated more data than the entire history of humanity, and it's gonna keep doubling every year. So uh, my question then is, are we, is this, uh, is, is the most radical uh, transformation, the most radical effect on the built environment and by consequence, the field of real estate development is it yet to come that we are, we are just seeing the tip of the iceberg now, or is it going to be more of the incremental change that we have been talking about earlier today? And this is addressed to everyone here. As I said before, because of uh, less than 1%, all the things around us are connected. We're just uh, the beginning of the, of the stage. So the opportunities are immense. I saw my colleagues presenting things like, for example, you know, waste, waste uh, optimization, water optimization, energy optimization. So I think uh, the point here is when you put all, the, all those things together under one uniform network, because all those kind of networks within the cities and also with all the residential areas, they have different technologies, different processes, and sometimes they are not connected, even culturally speaking. The people that they are responsible to administer and to manage those networks. When you develop on a common technology architecture based upon IP or, uh, technologies, 
and you redefine the processes, you could reduce substantially the water distribution, for example, because there, there is a big percentage of water distribution that get, get lost in the process. You can reduce substantially that loss. The same energy, the same, you can optimize the waste, the waste uh, uh, collection process all across. And you put sensors in all the waste containers. You redefine how the track that collects uh, uh, that waste will do it depending on the amount of the waste in those containers. We change every day. And, for, yeah, and you can optimize the timetable and ma many things uh, around. The same traffic. We know that more than a, we lose more than a 35% of our time in terms of trying to find a parking, especially in European cities, for example, or especially in emerging country cities. Uh, so if you set up a, a smart parking model together with the smart overall transportation system, and you reduce, you eliminate that time, it's more pro productive time for the people. The same when you are in a bus or in a train and you get connected 100%, you are connected online all the time. When you move from a bus or walking and you connect from the bus just to other places and the connection is automatic connection and you don't lose your connection, you can continue working and doing things all across. That increments substantially productivity. Or today, in some of the large cities, people spend two hours from home to the office. So in some cases, you can work from office, which is what I was calling virtual space. But in other cases, you, for any reason, depending on your job, you must be in the office or some specific places. So those, how you can predict those two hours, it's so important in terms of improving the standard of living. Sorry, anyone, anyone, yes, sir. Did you want to add something to that? I would only add that I, I agree it's the emerging economies where right. we're going right. to see this huge, these huge jumps um, in terms of those technologies and smart technologies. Um, you know, the smart city um, around the world is still up for grabs in terms of right. defining it because it's so controversial because, you know, people are living in poverty without potable water, without waste management, without public transit, really. Um, those are the cities that are saying, you know, what is this smart city agenda? But, 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 but you this, have to push back yeah. on that because, you know, a lot of people say, well, it's just ICT. I mean, that's, that's what smart means. But, you know, in the case of a city like um, Mumbai, for example, or um, a city in Rio or Buenos Aires or Johannesburg, um, you know, where, where some communities don't even have decent street lighting, um, you can have smart street lighting. That's why Philips is, you know, moving into that market and in, in many right. uh, lighting companies because you can actually improve street lighting with really smart street lighting instead of going, it's the old technological leapfrogging like right. cell phones, right. etc. So smart technologies going into the emerging markets I think will make huge, leap, right. um, huge gains, not just incremental right. that we might see here. But I mean, Sean, uh, you touched on this. Uh, when, when we think of smart cities, usually we have images of uh, 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 top-down infrastructure, but actually it's a, lo a lot also about grassroots innovation, and this is what we are witnessing now in emerging economies. Yeah, I, I think the only point that I'll make is, um, let's assume that the technology uh, is a given, right? So the, the rate at which costs will drop there are things that you couldn't imagine doing even five years ago that will be relatively cheap to do. So, I mean, I, people, I don't think people understand sort of how much, because we have so many of these devices, um, the guts of this device can do a lot of different things, right? The battery, the processor, um, uh, the sensors, the camera, right? So, so when you look at something even like self-driving cars, there's, the thing that holds back self-driving cars to some extent is the cost of the sensor. There's a LiDAR thing on the roof, so if you've seen a Google car, that's a very expensive bespoke sensor. The competing version of that is to say, I can use eight cell phone cameras. So suddenly I go from like 
a $10,000 thing to a $100 thing. So what would you do at $100? Well, you could do a lot more, right? Like that's an op option package someone is gonna add to a $50,000 car, maybe even a $25,000 car. Um, so I think the bigger issue, actually, the more interesting question for us is people, right? At what point do consumers decide, I will buy this thing from Amazon because it will pay for itself in a year? Or I will buy this thing because it's gonna be a lot of fun and I'll try going to work this way? Or as a business, eh, it looks like it could save 30%. I don't know if these guys are sort of weird or it will work, but we'll try it out because cutting 30% of my energy costs, yeah, we should have a go and try it out. So we spend probably 80% of our time working with early stage companies just trying to figure out how you get to a customer and convince them to pay for stuff. Because the value, the technology is there, but figuring out like how to make a compelling case to try it the first time, that often is the barrier that we spend a lot of time with. Actually, uh, in the, the Netherlands, for instance, they have a tool available online provided by the municipality whereby people can play out development scenarios with, it, with all the data and the regulatory framework and etc. So again, you can see here this kind of bottom up uh, uh, grassroots uh, uh, organization which may perhaps also have an impact on the, the development uh, framework. So I mean, we look forward to see something like that in Miami. Anyway, I, uh, of course I, I won't miss an opportunity to address the, uh, the one of the urgent issues in Miami, which is the rising sea uh, level. It's, as you know, this is ground zero. There's not one week where we don't have an article somewhere in the world in a magazine or a newspaper uh, sh showing Miami underwater. Uh, so uh, given the technologies that you describe and the data, et cetera, I will, I'm wondering if you have some thoughts about how uh, uh, these could actually uh, assist developers but also public agencies in tackling such environmental problems. Yeah. Okay. We, def we definitely see what I would call um, soft infrastructure, right? So, so most people think of um, a response to sea level rise along the lines of what you see in the Netherlands, which is very, very large um, sort of civil, civil engineering projects. So I think some of what we're starting to see is, um, can I model, can I produce um, software that explains the problem at a sort of parcel level? So this is not a sort of, this is not something that's gonna affect everyone at the same time. It probably affects certain people, certain owners, certain banks, certain insurance companies at different times. So one of the things that we see is um, just taking existing data to enable the story to be told at a very specific individual level and then we also see a lot of activity from groups that, frankly, as an angel investor, I would never interact with. But reinsurance companies are showing up and want to be part of um, some of the early investment rounds um, because they are starting to look at this and saying, okay, I'll, you know, one of the things we have to do, like Swiss reinsurance has, I think after the US Army, the largest uh, you know, sort of weather modeling capability in the world. Um, they know what they want to back. They know where the problems are. And so in a lot of ways, they're coming into the startup ecosystem and saying, if you can do these things, we would actually take this into the market, right, to help us assess. So the first layer for us is just um, data. I think, you know, the hard part when we look at those deals is um, what do people believe, right? Like, from where we sit, every time someone revises a sea level riot estimate, it doesn't get better, right? It doesn't go further into the future. It actually gets closer. Um, and so the, the, we want to do those deals, but we, we struggle a lot to figure out, well, who's the natural buyer, right? Local government always in, isn't always empowered. Um, you know, we think the insurance folks are the sort of first stop on that because they will control a lot of the ownership costs um, and then banks, right? So we'll go through financial services. That's our sort of likely path. Okay. I think we are running out of time. So maybe we can take one question or a couple from the audience, yes.
I can start. Um, <clears throat> I think it's that, um, I mean, I work a lot with cities, so I'm not really coming from the real estate side, and I work with them globally. So it's this um, learning across cities that I think is quite pivotal that's going to drive those innovations that we think of as disruptive technologies, et cetera, because they travel now because of data. Um, so the Amsterdam, Rotterdam, um, sea level change learning can happen now, um, you know, across cities. So I think that's part of it, but the public-private, I think, is really interesting. And the last panel, I think it was Don that was speaking, he talked about that little Summer Hill, um, Somerville, Massachusetts example of the shovel ready. Um, that, to me, is really an important example, as small as it is in a small place in Massachusetts, because I think that's, that's that handshake. We've talked about PPPs, we've talked about it for many years, but it hasn't really happened very well in the past. And I think that can be a real game changer for the real estate industry when cities have data that they can now talk to each other and, and have a better handshake through because it, it's informed learning across cities. I think that the, the uh, massive infrastructure that's going to be required, whether it's green infrastructure or sustainable infrastructure, I mean, these, the national government of China, the national government of India, the national government of Canada, the national government of Mexico, are putting out these huge infrastructure budgets. So when you start to invest those, that level of billions of dollars into infrastructure in cities, that's bound to have an incredible impact on real estate. And how do we ha make a better handshake on that? So I work with mayors and city managers um, on these questions around infrastructure investment because it's so pivotal right now in how we're, we're it's really a city building exercise, which is where we come to real estate and I think you know, this handshake has to be deeper. <laughs> today, My mic's falling off. <laughs> today, most of the cities, they are now defining what they call city operating system, which is a technology platform with different layers that you have uh, big data coming from all the million sensors I was describing at the beginning. And they also have applications we call analytics and they analyze that data. So, and they, they, that will produce a lot of business outcomes, social outcomes all across. And one of those could be obviously this, what we call a smart regulation, that the uh, city council will understand, will have more information about the citizens, about the patterns, about the, the wishes, the desires, and because they will, should be focused on see, improving citizen services, and standard of living, they will think in a regulation process that will set up technologies embedded into all the new construction and developments. And we have seen this already. And actually, I have seen cities pretty much advanced in terms of setting up that city operating system, working with companies like Cisco, working with companies like other technology companies, uh, defining that data point, that data income and so, as well as how to utilize. That, by the way, will have a, a great impact also in the private industry. Uh, I was mentioning retail industry, not only construction, but other industries. And even more important, what we call social inclusion. Because any, any environment is more innovative as long as they have a high levels of social inclusion. And the example I like to bring here very quickly is the Nazareth city in Israel that we, I had an experience there with, with a team that there are three different communities, Christian, Jewish, and Arab, and culturally very different, with difficult linkage, very poor communication, and how, to def how in the way the three city halls, city council define a collaborative technology platform, change that and put together in a ways that creating new collaborations and that was improved social inclusion and culturally that will impact to everything as well. One more question. No? I, th I think we're done. Thank you very much. Thank you.